Once you get beyond the oyster catchers, stilts, and other very distinctive shorebirds, a worthy challenge awaits you, the several dozen more typical shorebirds. But a quick glance at the huge array of seemingly identical birds crowding the pages of the field guide can easily lead to despair. How on earth does anyone ever figure them out? The trick is to reduce a large field of candidates to a small handful or even fewer. It then becomes a fairly simple job, usually, of checking the plates and text to arrive at the correct identification. Here are a few tips to help you do just that. When you try to untangle the knots of shorebird identification, your tendency may be to rely largely on color. Nearly all of us do at least until we learn that an overemphasis on color, in spite of all the visual pleasure it gives us, can lead to a kind of dead end in bird identification. If you let your eyes go no further than the gorgeous glowing red color of a breeding plumaged red knot, you will naturally have a hard time recognizing the same bird, should you encounter it during the nine months or so of the year when it wears a more anonymous silvery gray. That's not to suggest that you shouldn't enjoy breeding plumaged shorebirds whenever you see them. On the contrary, enjoy them to the hilt and use their distinctive briefly held colors as a way into a deeper understanding and recognition of their essential nature. Let's get rid of all colors for just a moment. One thing that varies little on birds is their shape. Sure, they may change posture as they run and feed, but a chunky dowager will never cast the same shadow as a svelte yellowlegs. When looking at shorebirds, it really helps to notice basic elements of proportion. Is the head small or large? Is it supported by a long neck, or does it sit squarely on the shoulders? Do the legs seem especially long and stilt-like, or are they more proportionate? It's particularly important to pay attention to bills. Shorebirds have evolved an amazing variety of bill shapes and sizes, each being well-suited to its owner's preferred method of foraging. It makes sense that a piping plover, with its short bill and big eyes, is a largely visual predator, first spotting its invertebrate prey, then dashing over to pluck it from the sand, while a long-billed, small-eyed stilt sandpiper probes deeply through water and mud, far beyond the range of its vision, feeling for its food. The turnstones use their short spiky bills to flip over pebbles, push aside seaweed clumps, or to dig down into the sand. The bill, being the tool of its ecological trade, is often the most unique indication of a shorebird's identity. Even better, bills tend not to change much with age or season. Few of us think of shorebirds as being particularly vocal, but most do at least give call notes, especially when flying. Moreover, their voices can be a big help in identifying them. A classic example is short-billed versus long-billed dowichers, often regarded as a very difficult ID to make but not if the birds are calling. The short build has a staccato two two two, while the long build gives a sharp worried keek, sometimes doubling or tripling it. Some shorebirds are as distinctive in their habitat preferences as they are in their looks. Buff-breasted sandpiper and upland sandpiper like grass or dirt fields more than shorelines. The upland sandpiper also has a wonderful, swooping breeding song. A few sandpipers are so fond of rocky habitats that birders often call them rock pipers. These include the tattlers, the surf bird, and rock and purple sandpipers. Other habitat cues are more subtle. Solitary sandpipers have a fondness for small ponds, often those in or near woods, and flooded fields with emergent weeds, while the rather similar lesser yellow legs tends to prefer mud flats and more open water situations, sometimes even swimming a bit. This habitat preference isn't enough to close the case, but it can still be a valuable clue. Before you even look at the pictures, you might want to glance at the range maps in the calendar. Doing so can sometimes help you differentiate even a very similar pair like western and semi-palmated sandpipers. In late fall and winter, you're vastly more likely to be seeing westerns, as nearly all semi-palmateds will have left for the tropics. Behavior is often helpful too. The spotted sandpiper doesn't always wear its namesake spots, but it gives away its identity in the way it moves, with a trademark teetering, tail-wagging gait. 
Ever see a flock of whitish sandpipers chasing and being chased by the waves along a winter beach? Those are sanderlings. And while you might see a sanderling behaving some other way or in another habitat, or see other shorebird species chasing waves, the combination of behavior, habitat, and season can allow you to make this identification without so much as lifting your binoculars. What about color? Is it of any use at all? Sure it is. If you notice a difference in color, that's often a great signal of a difference in species. Don't forget to consider leg color carefully, too. Many shorebirds have somewhat generic dusky or black legs. Anything different, yellow, greenish, pink, etc., can be very important to note. Beware of mud, though, which can at times make any color leg look blackish, as it has on this least sandpiper. Take advantage of any opportunity to study shorebirds, especially in flocks, where you can learn about the range of variation within a single species, as well as between similar species. And don't quit looking if they happen to flush. Once you get accustomed to following them in your binoculars, you'll be amazed at the information you can glean from flying birds, often including very useful field marks. Finally, birding with others who know more than you can be particularly beneficial when it comes to learning shorebirds. But be careful, once you're bitten by the shorebird bug, you may never want to go back in the woods.